but I see a lot of friends out here, and I want to thank all of you for coming this evening. And uh, this program is kind of geared towards kids, uh, but I think adults will find something interesting in it as well. You know, there's a battle that's raging for the minds and the hearts and the souls of our children and grandchildren. And it's interesting to note, too, that many, many children leave the faith, walk away from the church by the time they're in their early 20s. And the reason for this is the teaching of evolution in our schools and universities. The, uh, most of you, I'm sure all of you, have heard of Charles Darwin before. He wrote a book in 1859 called On the Origin of Species. And he had observed plant and animals in the uh, Galapagos Islands and had noticed how that they adapted to the ever-changing uh, weather conditions and food supplies and the climate. And he noticed that finches came in several varieties. Some had real thick beaks, some had thin beaks, some had pointed beaks, some had beaks that were in between. And he thought that was evidence of evolution. But guess what? They were still finches. They didn't evolve into another kind of animal. Um, some interesting statistics about kids leaving the church when they get into their uh, late teens and early 20s. Uh, several surveys have been uh, conducted in the last number of years. And if you aggregate them all together, 75% of our youth leave the church by the time they reach that age group. And it's because of the teaching of evolution. Now students who have a grounded faith, and I was going to say that these kids who walk away from the church are kids who grow up in Christian homes. And, uh, but they didn't have a real solid faith. They didn't receive the uh, teaching of Christian apologetics when they were in church. I think maybe that uh, the subjects, the scientific subjects that uh, they're taught are intimidating to a lot of the uh, pastors and they don't want to get involved in something that they don't know a lot about. So they just uh, kind of gloss over that and don't make that a priority. But the churches who, uh, or the students who did study apologetics from a young age and grew up in the church when they went off to the university, they retained their Christian faith. And better yet, those who um, did have a, a background in Christian apologetics in, in church still attend church. And I think it's so important for us as parents and, and uh, church leaders, whatever, to give our kids the opposite of what they're being taught in school from the evolution. You know, it's just, it's godless that what they're being taught. And we need to be able to have a, um, <clears throat> the influence that we need to have so that when our children and grandchildren grow up, they will be prepared to raise their family and teach their children. We're responsible for that as parents. And so I did this program this evening, um, geared for kids, and uh, we're going to see some characters in here this evening. So if we could have the lights killed, and uh, we will start the, the program here, and, in just a minute. Very good. Okay.
Come in. Hi, Grandpa. Well, hello, Kayla. It's so nice to see you. Please come in and have a seat. So, what brings my lovely granddaughter to my study today? Well, Grandpa, we've been learning about things in science class that have me a little bit confused. My teacher has been talking about how the universe started and how life started on Earth. I remember talking about the subject with you before and hearing about creation. My teacher says that we evolved from a single life form and that life form branched out into different species and humans then evolved from apes. He says quotes from university professors who don't believe in God and say that evolution is a fact and that creation by God is a myth. And I just don't understand how nothing became condensed to a single point and that exploded to create everything. So are we supposed to believe that from this explosion all matter turned into an orderly system of planets and life on this earth? Caleb, when I was your age, I had a science teacher who told us that evolution was just a theory for those who didn't want to believe in God. Back then, we were taught that the Earth was between 100,000 and maybe 200,000 years old, and that humans evolved from apes. And now we're being told that the Earth is 4.7 billion years old, and that the universe is around 13 billion years old. That's a lot of aging in just 60 years. But Grandpa, my teacher makes fun of people who believe in God, especially the fact that he created everything in six days. Well, the Bible has an answer for those who deny God as the creator of the universe. In the book of Romans, we read, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Here, let me turn my computer around so you can see someone who doesn't believe that God was the creator. And there's a whole galaxy, it's about a billion light years away. We're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. But so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. I'm going to stop it because we're out of sync here. And uh, I'm going to try to see if we, can, if we can get this going again. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. And exploding stars shine with the brightness of 10 billion stars. They're the brightest fireworks in the universe, supernova. Sorry about this. light years away. We're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. But so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. And exploding stars shine with the brightness of 10 billion stars. They're the brightest fireworks in the universe, supernova. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars are kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay, and, and anyway. Well, here is another person who denies God and insults those who do believe in God. 
denial of evolution is unique to the United States. I mean, we are the world's most advanced technological, so I mean, you could say Japan, but generally the United States is where most of the innovation still happens. People still move to the United States. Uh, and that's largely because of the intellectual capital we have, the, the general understanding of science. When you have a portion of the population doesn't believe in it, it holds everybody back, really. Evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science, in all of biology. It's like, it's very much analogous to trying to do geology without believing in tectonic plates. You're just not going to get the right answer. Your whole world is just going to be a mystery instead of an exciting place. As my old professor Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So once in a while, I get people that really, or that claim they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, oh, why not? Really, why not? Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. I mean, what? Here are these ancient dinosaur bones or fossils. Here is uh, radioactivity. Here are distant stars that are just like the, our star, but that are a different point in their life cycle. The idea of deep time of this billions of years uh, explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your, your world view just becomes crazy. It just uh, untenable, itself inconsistent. And I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your, in your uh, world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it, because we need them. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need people that can, uh, we need engineers that can build stuff, solve problems. It's, it's just really a hard thing. It's, it's really a hard thing. You know, in another couple centuries, though, that worldview, I'm sure, will be, it just won't exist. It's, there's no evidence for it. So. You know, we are all going to stand before God on Judgment Day, and we will all have to give an account for all of our actions. Listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 18. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. I'll tell you what, Caleb, let's think of the earth as it is today, and imagine that we could look back in time about 6,000 years at the very beginning of creation. But let's see what the Bible has to say in the book of Genesis. created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. 
and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day, and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. I was thinking about an event that I attended recently, and sort of like a TED Talk where someone talks to an audience about a topic of interest to those attending. Now, this particular presentation is called an Alvin Talk. I found it to be entertaining, but also very informative. And I have a video here that may help you with a different viewpoint that's not being taught in many schools today. Let's watch Alvin Quincy Snodgrass as he talks about creation, and evolution.
Thank you all for attending my lecture this evening about creation and evolution. You know, in today's politically correct environment, it's just not proper to refer to people like me as dummies. So... <laughs> I recently had a chance to interview the famous French chef Louis Poulet Foie Gras Baguette a la carte. We'll just refer to him as Chef Louis. Today we are visiting with Chef Louis Poulet a la carte. Chef Louis what are you working on today? Oh, I am working on a dish called Deja Vu Primordial Stew. It's an old recipe from the French Evolution. Don't you mean the French Revolution? No, I mean the French Evolution. You see, we believe that all life came from a primordial stew. So today, I am going to produce more chickens and more eggs from this special recipe. That sounds pretty silly to me, Chef Louis. How is that supposed to work? Well, I take two eggs that have all the ingredients to make a chicken. The eggs have everything we need. The yolk, the egg white, the shell. Watch while I put the eggs into the blender and mix them all up. into a cup. <laughs> then we set it outside and wait for lightning to strike it. chicken that will make more eggs, and those eggs will make more chickens, and those chickens will make more eggs, and those eggs... Okay, okay, I get it. But where did the two eggs that you started with come from? From a chicken, of course. And where did that chicken come from? Ah, from the primordial stew. And where did the primordial stew come from? From stardust. Duh. I'm sorry, Chef Louis, but I think I'm going to believe what the Bible tells us about where the chickens came from. In the book of Genesis, it says, And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. You see, it was God who created all life, and he spoke of all creation into existence. God didn't use millions or billions of years to create the world and everything that is in it. All of creation happened in six days. That's what God told us in the Bible, and you can believe it because it's the truth. I wanted to suggest that Chef Louie take a friend to lunch at the local deli and have one of them order an egg salad sandwich and the other one order a chicken salad sandwich and see which one comes first. <laughs> Actually, here is how an egg turns into a chicken in 21 days.
really interesting, Grandpa. Do you think that there was ever such a thing as primordial seas where life evolved on Earth? No, I don't, Kayla. God created the Earth and everything in it during six days. And there are very smart scientists who tell us that it is mathematically impossible for all the ingredients necessary for life to assemble themselves in such a way that life could begin. There are just too many obstacles to overcome. And if you listen to evolutionists carefully, you will hear magic words to bypass the causes to go from one step to another. Some of the words or phrases, as an example, are evolved, burst on the scene, suddenly appeared, borrowed from another structure, gradually changed, and so on. But you know, if you leave God out of the equation and start from a false premise and base your research on that premise, it's impossible to ever know the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it tells us, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Thank you, Grandpa. I really learned a lot today, and I'm going to listen to what my teachers tell me in science class. I'm going to ask for evidence about why they believe in the religion of evolution. Let's go back to the Alvin talk and see what else he has for us. We all have a worldview, and we interpret what we see through our own filters. In this illustration, look at the character and decide if this is an old woman or a young woman. One person may see an elderly woman looking to the side. Another person will see a young woman looking away from the viewer. Or how about this illustration? Is this person looking up or looking down? It all depends on your perspective. There is a secular view of creation and a Christian view of creation. One view rejects the view that God created the universe and everything it contains. And the other view believes that God designed and created the universe and that he revealed his awesome creativity in nature, even down to the tiniest micromolecular motors. Let's look in on a couple of friends who meet each month to discuss current topics regarding creation science. Here is Dr. Capillary and Officer Glaze. I'm so glad we could meet today and talk about our latest discoveries in creation science. Did you know that there are little molecular motors working right now in the cells of your body? Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding. I recorded a special lecture about these tiny little machines. They are so amazing and complicated. I couldn't wait to show you. Watch this. Perhaps the most amazing propulsion system on our entire planet is one that exists in bacteria. It's called the flagella, a miniature propeller driven by a motor with many distinct mechanical parts, each made of proteins. The flagellum's motor resembles a human designed rotary engine. It has a universal joint, bushings, a stator, and a rotor. It has a drive shaft and even its own clutch and braking system. In some bacteria, the flagellar motor has been clocked at 100,000 revolutions per minute. The motor is bi-directional and can shift from forward to reverse almost instantaneously. Some scientists suggest it operates at near 100% energy efficiency. All of this is done on a microscopic scale that is hard to imagine. The diameter of the flagella motor is no more than five millionths of a centimeter. The bacterial flagellum is one of many molecular machines that scientists have discovered in the last several decades, including energy producing turbines, information copying machines, and even robotic walking motors. The origin of these exquisite examples of nanotechnology is a mystery that has generated heated controversy among biologists over the past two decades. 
suppose you said, I want to build a mousetrap and I'll go into the garage and try to co-opt some old things that I find there uh, for use in the new mousetrap. And you see that a mousetrap needs a spring and in your garage you have an old clock. So you pull out a spring from that. And you see that the mousetrap has a, a metal bar and you've got a crowbar in your garage. And you see that it's got another metal piece, the hammer, and you've got you know, the fender of a bicycle. Well, you can't make a mousetrap from all those pieces because they have been fit for their other roles and they will not work as pieces of mousetrap unless they are extensively reworked or refitted. And that, of course, is intelligent design. Even under a Darwinian view, you would not expect pieces to be laying around that would be fit for roles in other complex systems because you would expect natural selection to shape them very tightly to the role that they are currently fulfilling. And so to be used for something else, they would have to be reshaped, retooled before being used. And then you have the problem with irreducible complexity all, all over again. One way or another, you've got to now address the question of the origin of these irreducibly complex systems that we find in living systems, whether we're talking about the flagellar motor, or the ATP synthase, or the kinesin walking motor protein, or the circuitry, or the gene expression system, or uh, whatever it is. The biology inside the box is really complex, and it's an integrated and functional complexity that requires some kind of an explanation. And I think. Just by highlighting that, Mike has uh, reframed the debate in a way that I think has changed the way people think about biology in the 21st century. That is impressive, but I suppose that we will be asked to believe that this process happened by random chance. That's what kids are being taught in many schools these days. You know, that reminds me of the scripture verse in Psalms that says, I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. I certainly agree with that. When you think of the systems of the human body that all have to come together in the proper time and proper order, it just amazes me how anyone could believe that gradual evolution over millions or billions of years could explain human life. You have the circulatory system, the digestive and excretory system, the endocrine system, the system responsible for skin, hair, nails, etc. And then you have the immune system, the muscular system, the nervous system, the renal and urinary systems, the reproductive system, the respiratory system, and the skeletal system. All of these systems are designed to work together in harmony in our body. And yet, people are so anxious to believe life outside of our Creator that they make up fantasies in order to justify the rebellion against God. So that's my soapbox for today. Tell me, what have you discovered recently? Well, this ties right in with what you just showed me. There is a group of scientists, over 1,000 of them, PhDs no less, that have come to the conclusion that Darwin's theory of evolution is impossible. I found a short video that declares their conclusions. Not all of these scientists are creationists, and some don't believe in intelligent design, but they have dismissed his theories. Watch this. I'm skeptical of the claim. I'm skeptical. 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 We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Skeptical. 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 Skeptical of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity. Complexity. The complexity. The complexity. To account for the complexity of life. 
careful examination, examination. examination. of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. much evidence that confirms the truth of the Bible, not only in biology, but in other disciplines as well. I am really looking forward to our next chat. us to consider the worldwide flood of Noah's day. Let's imagine that we could talk to Noah himself and get some perspective on the event that changed the world. And this interview is based on the account from the Bible. Mr. Noah, I think the first question many people would ask you is whether the flood was local or global. It was absolutely global. God told me to build an ark because the people on the earth had become so wicked and evil that he was going to destroy the earth with water. I preached repentance for 120 years and the people just laughed at me, thought I was crazy. But on the day the rain started falling and the water began to rise, I was inside the ark with my family and the animals that God had sent. Then God closed the door, and no one could open it. God said he regretted making man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. His direct words were, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. I was six hundred years, two months, and seventeen days old. On that very day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heavens were opened, and it rained for forty days and forty nights. The flood kept coming, and as the water increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth until it floated on the surface of the water. The water kept rising until all the mountains, even the highest mountains on the earth, were covered to a depth of fifteen cubits. That's about twenty-two and a half feet above the highest mountain. From the time the eight of us entered the ark to the time we left was three hundred and seventy-one days, a little more than a year. Everything on the face of the earth was wiped out, including all people, animals, the creatures that moved along the ground, and the birds were wiped from the earth. It was during this time that the earth broke apart and new continents were formed. As these large masses of land slid into each other, it caused mountains to rise and the valleys to fall. There was tremendous volcanic activity that continued to stir up sediments and minerals and they sloshed back and forth across the earth and deposited many layers of sediment that buried all the animals who died during the flood. The shapes of some of those animals were preserved as the earth dried out, and many of the dead animals only left their bones to be discovered 
at a later time. Thank you so much, Mr. Noah. I really appreciate your time today. And we are now going to jump ahead in time about 4,500 years, and we want to examine some evidence of the Great Flood that we just heard about. So at this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Mr. Chuck. In recent years, a technology called HDR photography has matured, and HDR stands for High Dynamic Range Photography. And what it is, is a technique by which you take a photograph of a subject at normal exposure, and then you take some overexposed and some underexposed. And the software then combines the three images into one, and it brings out details in the shadows and in the highlights that otherwise you wouldn't see and the camera wouldn't pick up. And it results in stunning images sometimes. And this is the technique that I used when I was out photographing rock formations. And as a result of those photographs, I discovered fossilized animal shapes in rock formations all over the state of Colorado. And here, let me show you what I mean by high dynamic range photography. In this example, we start with three photographs with a moving hawk coming towards the camera. The first exposure is what the camera's metering system thinks is normal for the scene. And the second photograph is underexposed by two f-stops. The third photograph is overexposed by two f-stops. All these images are combined to create a new image with more color and more contrast. People often have asked what gave me the idea to photograph rock formations in HDR. And it was an accident of sorts, but I believe it was a divine accident. You see, I whispered a prayer asking that something good would come from this project and that God would be glorified through it. A few years ago, my oldest grandson played football for a local high school at the base of the Colorado foothills west of Denver. Before his junior and senior years, I made a canvas banner that was five feet high and 47 feet wide. I started by photographing each athlete on a green background. This allowed me to arrange the players in the order that I wanted and in the groupings that I needed. Next, I photographed some rock formations to use as the background, and then put the football players on them to give the impression that they were all in one place at one time with everyone's eyes open and paying attention to the photographer. <laughs> so the banner was a big hit, but the real benefit of doing this project was the discovery of what I found in the rocks using the HDR technique. I knew that this area was known for containing fossils and dinosaur prints but I was surprised by how many marine animal shapes there were. Studying the many photographs I took, I began to see shapes that were different than just random chunks of rock. This struck me as being odd because Colorado is the one state out of the 50 that has the highest average elevation. So what were marine animals doing at a mile above sea level? Now we don't know what the elevation of Colorado was at the time of the Genesis Flood, nor do we know the elevation of any place on Earth at the time of the Flood. But we do know that it was entirely underwater at one time. In the book of 2 Peter, we read, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Today, Colorado's average elevation is 6,800 feet above sea level. Wyoming is 6,700 feet. Utah, 6,100 feet. New Mexico, 5,700 feet. And Nevada has an average elevation of 5,500 feet above sea level. Something else you might find interesting is every Colorado 14er has seashells on them. Even the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, has marine fossils on the upper formations of the mountain. 
An ocean of water is found 620 miles below the Earth's surface. Two separate studies found evidence of oceans of water in Earth's lower mantle. The first study found a water-filled mineral called brucite that exists in the deep Earth. A second study found that this water is much deeper than any seen before. It's unclear how much water is being stored, but the studies suggest that it could be much more than all the oceans put together. Extreme Tech senior editor Sebastian Anthony wrote, after decades of theorizing and searching, scientists are reporting that they finally found a massive reservoir of water in the Earth's mantle, a reservoir so vast that it could fill the Earth's oceans three times over. This discovery suggests that Earth's surface water actually came from within as a part of a whole Earth water cycle, rather than the prevailing theory of icy comets striking Earth billions of years ago. With the underwater volcanic activity and the fountains of the deep bursting forth, a lot of minerals and sediment would have been stirred up. Billions of animals died in the floodwaters, and many of them were buried in mud and sediment keeping their shapes preserved. Let's take a look at some of the creatures, or at least their shapes, that were turned into mud fossils or rock fossils. Here is a wall of mud and minerals that has been waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. This could possibly be a Kentrosaurus, which means spiked lizard that grew to about 17 feet long and believed to weigh 2,000 pounds. This was thought to be a land animal, but look right beneath it and you will see a creature that looks like it lived in the sea. I think it's interesting that a land animal and a sea animal were deposited together in the same place. And the most logical explanation for this is that water carried them here. There are several locations in our area that have a similar animal shape to this sea creature. This sea animal was found in the Evergreen area at about 6,500 feet above sea level. And this one was found near Morrison. This image is packed with animals, but the most prominent ones are the ones that look like a lizard on top and a fish that's face to face with the crocodile fish. In the same area, just a few feet away, is what I believe to be the leg of a dinosaur. It's about eight feet in length, and you can see what appears to be a knee joint. Also, in this same area were these animals. Notice the texture of the surface is very rough. Less than a mile away is a sea creature turned to stone. You can see the flipper on the side and the head turned back in what some describe as the classic death pose. This happened when the animal was struggling to breathe and died in this position. Many people are familiar with the dinosaur tracks at Dinosaur Ridge west of Denver. These prints are headed uphill, which suggests that the dinosaurs were looking for higher ground as the floodwaters approached. This animal could have been a dinosaur also. He's on his side, but notice the crest at the back of his head. I don't know if this is a large bird or another sea animal. Whatever it is, it's about four feet in length, has a menacing beak and eyes. Here we find a huge rock wall that has been hiding something for a very long time. Have you ever seen a 60 foot long worm? I suppose it would have made a nice meal for some of the large hungry sea animals prowling the oceans. If you study the anatomy of an earthworm, you will see something like this, only on a much, much smaller scale. Here is another worm-like creature, but without the number of segments as the previous worm. I can't tell if it's coming or going, but notice the marine creature right below it. Do you see what I see? I see a head of some kind with two eyes and two lips and look at this five foot high bird, now a piece of rock. Here is a pile of mud turned to stone that covered several animals. 
This has to be the head of an animal. Look at the teeth. And this animal is right below the previous one. And look at these. There are a number of additional animals in this pile also. This looks like something lying on its back. You can see two flippers. One is clean and the other is covered in pine needles. To hunters, this might remind you of a wild turkey, but it seems that it is definitely a bird of some kind. There is an interesting character in here, and it might remind you of the Simpsons from the TV show. Here is another interesting animal on the side of a rock. I wonder if this thing was venomous. I don't think I'd like to get close enough to find out. This specimen is about the size of a house cat, and I wonder if it had a long tongue. Does this look like the bottom of a foot to you? It has six toes instead of five. In the Old Testament book of Samuel, chapter 21, verse 20, we read, And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. It's about twelve feet from the top finger to the bottom of the wrist. There are skulls of animals all over Colorado. Some are just bones, and some are turned to stone. This one is located in Jefferson County at an elevation of 5,500 feet above sea level. This is the head of a large animal, but notice its tiny eye. And here is a closer look at that. And you can tell that this is the head of an animal because of the preserved eye. This rock skull is either from a large bird or perhaps a medium-sized dinosaur. And this is from an area known for being rich in fossils. Well, your guess is as good as mine, but look at the eye and the large nostril. This is the neck and head attached to the body of what appears to be a large bird. This is from a relatively small rock outcropping and it has a reptilian-like head. This larger outcropping is about six feet high. There are two large sea creatures here, one on top of the other. Among the several animals in this group of rocks, this one is the most prominent. I don't know if this thing lived on land or in the water, but you can see the large scales on its body. I wish I knew what lies beneath these plates, but the soil conditions in this location are such that anything below the surface would disintegrate very easily. It's easy to imagine that large animals were seeking higher ground, but exposure to the elements has caused them to deteriorate just leaving the overall shapes intact. This might be a supersized swan or other aquatic bird. The distance from the front of the head to the back is about 24 inches. There are a number of rocks just west of Denver that show simple invertebrate animals. This one is only about two inches in length and this one about three inches. Here is a rock wall comprised of many layers of sediment and crusted animals which were carried and deposited by floodwaters. We find the same thing in this image. The topmost animal looks like a giant reptile. Notice the armored skin surface. And judging by the size of the trees, the giant croc is about 200 feet in length. Here is one more deposit of ocean animals buried rapidly on top of each other. Many cultures around the world have stories about dragons. And I believe there were dragons in Colorado as well. Do you see fins and skin texture here? The things discovered in this rock outcropping have evoked statements like, I'll never look at rocks the same way again. I believe all these creatures lived in the sea, 
and this sea animal is nearly identical to others found in the same general area. Here is another outcropping that is beautiful in its own right, and you're probably picking out some of the animal shapes already. And attached to the same rock structure, At 5,500 feet in elevation, more large sea critters are deposited in rock layers. Wouldn't it have been interesting to see these animals alive? From a distance, of course. This seahorse dragon is about 8 feet tall and is found at about an altitude of 8,500 feet. This looks like an alligator or a crocodile. Not every rock formation or outcropping has evidence of animals in them, but many do. I believe that the mineral elements reacted with the chemical elements of the various animals to produce all these colors. There are plenty of animal shapes here too. And this is just part of a formation that extends hundreds of feet and is loaded with fossilized animal shapes. People see different things in this image. Some say it's an optical illusion, but I see a large lizard-like animal with another animal in its mouth. I would like to encourage you to go on your own adventure and look at the world around you, but from a different perspective. if anybody has a question yeah if you have a if you have a question um, I guess my first question is is this mic on yeah. check all right if you have a question if you have a question uh, just raise your hand uh, Chuck will call on you and I will run the mic to you as fast as I can. 
So, go ahead. So when you're, is this on? So when you're looking at the rock formations with the naked eye, you can't see that stuff without the help of the HDR photography, is that right? Or? Well, the HDR photography really makes things pop. Um, I, take, I took almost 10,000 pictures for this project, and I got to be where I could uh, identify what uh, looked promising. But when I went back and processed the images with the HDR software and studied that image, that's when I could see what was in the rocks. Gotcha. I've seen uh, pictures on the internet of skeletons of giants, and I'm kind of skeptical about what I'm seeing. But I've heard that uh, supposedly the Smithsonian Institute her museum has a collection of them, but they're keeping them under wraps because they don't want the obvious connotation to come out that, yeah, there were giants like the Bible said. That's true. Uh, in fact, they uh, have destroyed many of those. They didn't want the, uh, the public to see that there were giants. But there's a, an Indian, uh, Navajo Indians and uh, Southwest Indians, uh, the tribes, uh, recognized that uh, giants were hostile to them and the story you know how they they would approach and the Indians would go up like this and say how well they want the the person on the other side because some of those giants you know they would have six fingers and they wanted to count the fingers before they wanted to get close to them now I don't know if that's true or not but that's the uh, that's the story I've heard back here in the corner What did you use to make the movie? What did I use? Well, I, I learned some software over the last couple of months. <clears throat> I used uh, Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects, and um, I recorded everything in, in the basement of my home. question. The reason I know that they're not uh, things like uh, seeing things in the clouds <clears throat> is because the exact animals are in locations that are you know, in the area, but they're in different locations. And the probability of those being created by water and wind erosion are zero. Uh, the sea creatures that I, I found that were with the head and then the, just the body, no limbs or anything, there are a number of those um, just west of Denver. Can I weigh in on that too? Yes. Um, one of the things, as far as I know, Chuck, there haven't been any actual studies yet where somebody's taken one of those um, images and, and uh, analyzed their uh, rock samples from it. Is, is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> um, so this, this is a science project in progress, but one of the things that really got me as I was looking through Chuck's book is that the eyes, they were always in the right place for eyes relative to the snout or whatever the creature had. And, and you can go get a copy of his book and look through there and, and you'll, you know, everything that's got an eye in it see that eye is always in the right place and again the chances of that happening uh, just by some random erosional event are almost nil. Um, any more questions? 
How often do you take other people up to see rock formations? Well, I took my grandson with me a couple of years ago, but uh, it's a tedious thing. You know, you just uh, you walk and you look at rocks and take pictures and and uh, now some of the ones that I have uh, I've identified the counties that the rocks that I believe have animals in them. Uh, I've identified the counties they're located in, but not the exact location. Uh, I have heard stories of uh, people who have found these things and they destroyed them or defaced them uh, because they don't want any evidence to show that, uh, that the flood was a real event. Anyone else? software help you identify some of the colors I mean, as you're looking through the shapes but I can see like you had a kind of grayed out some of the color around does that help with that? I would mask out the backgrounds and, and desaturate the color so that the subject would be more prominent uh, if I didn't do that you'd be searching around on the page for a long time to see what was there and by subduing the color around that object, it makes that that much more visible. I was wondering, uh, I've heard stories, I don't know if this is true or not, that people who chase snipers are typically colorblind. And uh, that's what they would in Vietnam. People that they knew the snipers were up in the trees, they would take somebody who's colorblind and they could spot the sniper prior to other ones. So, my question basically is and I do happen to be colorblind, red and green officially, but, but if you were colorblind, would you see them more readily than if you were not? It's just a general question. I, I don't know the answer to that. We had one over here. Yeah, the high dynamic range um, technique does pop the colors. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, yeah, the um, and that and the HDR will enhance the color to some degree, and then it's more important at that point to subdue the other color around it. Okay. That was in western Colorado, and uh, it's another canyon that was formed when the when the floodwaters receded off the earth uh, after the flood, and it carved these canyons. And I believe that it, it, uh, some of the large animals that were found in those rock formations were exposed when that those canyons were carved out. You know, in 1980, Mount St. Helens um, it was uh, canyons were created in just a matter of hours and days and not over millions of years and there's a river that uh, flows through there now that uh, you know they they say that uh, the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon well that's just not possible and so the uh, it's the floodwaters that were receding off the earth and you've seen what flood floodwaters can do they can destroy and and just change the face of, uh, of the topography 
and that's what happened. Thank you for your marvelous production. It was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about fossils in general. Okay. Uh, we know that in order for fossils to be preserved, they have to be very rapidly buried, or else they would decay and not be fossils anymore. Every single fossil that I have ever seen has been the result of excavation of a site where the bones were buried and then recovered by the diligence of the paleontologists. But none of the pictures that you showed us were buried. They were yeah. all surface rocks. Yeah. So doesn't that give you pause? Well, the bones uh, would be evidence of the decaying of the animal itself with having the, the bones still uh, <clears throat> preserved. But when the uh, fountains of the deep opened up and all that settlement was stirred up and the water sloshed back and forth depositing layers all those animals were built were buried some of them very deep but some of them uh, more shallowly and it was those animals that uh, that were covered by the minerals and the sediments and so forth that preserved their shapes and they were covered rapidly enough so that oxygen couldn't get to them and uh, decompose the, the shape of the animal. That's what I believe. Well, I want to thank you again for coming out this evening. And um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for your attention and for watching the presentation.